Bingo, Monday, 1 o'clock rock. Research in Manoa. Uh, Jeff Gillis Davis and uh, Hope Ishii, both PhDs at uh, uh, the Institute, the Hawaii Institute for uh, Geophysics and Planetology, uh, which is part of SOAS, the School for Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa. Welcome to the show, you guys. Thank Thanks, you. Jay. Yeah. So, um, what is your science there at HIGP? Um, hope you start. Well, I actually study comet dust and asteroid uh, dust for the most part, and also the fine-grained material in um, larger meteorite rocks. Yeah, so when focus. you take one of your reports and put it on the, the shelf, it gets dusty immediately. Then. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of dust we don't want mixed in with our comet <laughs> okay. dust, or it confuses the matter. <laughs> What's the difference? Uh, well, dust from comets and asteroids come from these bodies that haven't gone through all the differentiation that our larger planetary bodies have. And so they um, largely preserve the, um, the materials that were around at the start of our solar system. Mm -hmm. And Total so we're able to, that. yes, we're able to, by studying these materials, we're basically able to look at materials from all the way back at the beginning of, of our solar system and, and get information about the conditions. That and when was that exactly? Can you give me a date? Oh, approximately 4.65 billion years Thank ago. You. <laughs> but who's counting? Plus or minus. <laughs> Jeff, what about you? Is your science the same as Hope's science? No, um, we do work a lot together, um, but our science is parallel in a lot of cases. You know, I study rocks from the moon and remote sensing data of the moon, as well as mercury. And then where we overlap a lot is I study asteroids and meteorites and try and connect the meteorites that we have here on Earth, which are chips off of asteroids. Um, so that we can understand the composition of asteroids better. And of course, you know, asteroids and meteorites are giving off the dust that some of which um, HOPE collects. And HOPE even has a facility on the Big Island that collects some of these um, dust particles. Uh, on, uh, Mauna Loa? Mauna Loa Observatory. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm yeah. not sure what you meant by that question. Oh, you, you must have said something to provoke. Uh-oh. Uh yeah, uh, what's her name? Siri. Uh, Alexa. Siri? <laughs> Alexa, sorry. Oops, I, said, I said it again. We have Alexa here at the table. If you want her to say anything or answer a question or play music, we can do that. <laughs> Courtesy Amazon. <laughs> Where did I park my car? <laughs> First you have to give her a name, but don't. I'll give her a name. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay, so anyway, so um, uh, you guys are involved in research, and I, I would like somebody to tell me what, what it is research. When you wake up in the morning and you say, gee, I think I'll go research something today. What's that like? <laughs> it's, a, it's a process. It's not something, it's, 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 an, it's an ongoing process. Um, you, you learn a little bit and then you realize how much more you don't know. And so you're constantly moving, moving forward a little bit and seeing how, how vast the expanse is of, of things that you don't know. Yeah. It's exciting. It's, it's like being always at the front, the frontier uh -huh. of knowledge. And that frontier for me is, you know, ignorance on one side and, and what I know on the other side and, you know, trying to dispel that ignorance and figuring out how the world works. That's why I became a scientist because I was curious about the world and I found that geology was a way to kind of, you know, satisfy that curiosity you know why are mountains in a certain area why are volcanoes in a certain area why are earthquakes uh, where they are and through the science of studying earth geology you know you get to understand those answers um, and then from there make a hypothesis and prediction of you know other you know geologic phenomena really pushing pushing the barriers pushing pushing space and time continuum right and through studying the earth we can study you know uh, apply it to places like the moon or mercury or venus yeah. or in moons of um, the icy satellites um, or to uh, the asteroids um, and even comets well actually so west and higp are world famous in this area aren't they 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 draw attention they their papers your papers and uh, your discoveries are world world known around the world aren't they you're a magnet aren't you we don't uh, like to yeah. brag. <laughs> we don't like to brag, but blushing. <laughs> no, but I mean, we, we have somehow achieved uh, a level of e excellence here at UH Manoa that is, that is known everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, this is definitely one of the world centers of excellence for this, this area of research. Yeah. Hmm. So you have to figure out your own, when you wake up in the morning doing research, you have to f 
figure out what, what you can research that day. How do you figure that out? Is it that border of ignorance and bliss? <laughs> <laughs> well, we do set up, you know, um, when we have a, a problem, you know, pretty much we've always have written a proposal to NASA and outline uh, our hypo hypothesis and how we're going to test that. Uh, so we're usually following that process. And sometimes, you know, you're, you're trying to test it and it's not quite working out. And you might find it in that quiet moment it's just before you fall asleep or in the shower or you wake up in the middle of the night, oh, that's what I've got to do. Um, so science isn't something that, you know, you leave at five o'clock and you, you know, leave it on your desk and you come back in the morning and there it is waiting for you. It's, it is something that's always kind of going on. And, and not only as far as the science that, uh, you know, you're doing for work, it's, you know, science at home and, you know, having fun with the, the kids, you know, um, talking about how uh, my car do lands on one side of the car, but not the other side of the car. And then talking to my son, who's only eight, about thermal radiation and how the ground on one side of the car keeps it warm so the dew doesn't, you know, collect or condense on that side. And it's just, you know, for me, a fun way to see the world all the time. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. It's a way to see the world. Mm -hmm. It's a way to see thought process. It's a way to advance human knowledge. That's thrilling, isn't it? It is. <laughs> and, w and part of what's interesting to me is I think sometimes that kids do this in a very natural way. Um, kid kids are natural scientists. They, they're, they're exploring their, their world and learning about it. And I think as we get older, sometimes we think we've already got it all figured out and we, we forget that process of of asking questions and can't do that. Kind of with ideas of why. <laughs> so when you meet these people, you know, and they're really elderly, but they 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 think young. They, they think like mm -hmm. they're 16. Those are the ones who are curious about everything. Those are the ones who are still trying to put it together in the middle of the night, waking up at two o'clock in the morning and saying, "Aha! Uh -huh, I got it. Now I got it. I got it." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, okay, the reason I wanted to know about that is because you're trying to. Uh, inculcate that into undergraduates in, in this new program that you're doing with teaching um, those these kinds of what uh, let's see geophysics and planetology I suppose and your respective uh, areas of expertise to undergraduate students at UH um, why why do you want to do this why do you want to have a new interactive course a new mm, educational experience with them what's missing in the current protocol well, I think one thing is the lag time between when something gets into a book and gets to the students versus, you know, like you recognize, you know, we're world leaders in doing planetary research. You know, what we learned today, we could put in our class tomorrow. And, you know, it's, it's new and it's exciting, and we're excited to, to teach like that. Um, the other reason was, you know, science isn't about just learning terms. It, you know, we do have our vocabulary. We do use it among each other. But it doesn't have to be the place they start learning. You know, when you're three, five, ten, what you're trying to do by asking all those questions is learn how the world works. And that's what we want the undergraduates at UH Manoa to do. We want them to see how the world works by asking questions and then going explore the answers. The answers, you know, are the, the questions that they want to answer. Uh, and then that way they become more engaged. Uh, and learn the scientific process. They learn critical thinking. You know, all those key things that not are only requirements of this class, but can be applied, you know, outdoors in, you know, any setting in their, their, their workplace. Yeah, in life. And they also in have to learn to communicate what, you know, they have to communicate what they've learned. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the process of, of um, <clears throat> presenting um, it, what it, you've learned and how you went about doing it. That's is, essentially the science skill. fair coming up in April, <laughs> as it does every year. Yeah. But you guys remind me of a fellow named Alex Filipenko. Filipenko is a physicist at um, UC somewhere. Mm. I want to say UC Santa Barbara. I want to say that, but it could be UC somewhere else. And um, he came here about a year ago and spoke in the, in the Kennedy uh, Auditorium there about um, some kind of... Um, some kind of physics and space issue. I, I, I can remember it if you give me time, but it, that doesn't matter. <clears throat> and, and I went, and, I, and we filmed it, and we made an OC-16 movie on it. But <clears throat> what, what was remarkable is that I didn't understand what he was talking about. And I tried. I tried to listen to him, but I didn't know what he was talking about. You know, physics. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, but at the end, he called for questions. So up 
races, all these eight-year-old kids, they understood everything he said. <laughs> And they ask him the most amazingly sophisticated questions. I don't know how you do that. It's maybe it's not generational. It's what you're talking about. It's the open mind. Mm -hmm. It's unleashing. Is what he did. He got lots of awards for being a popular teacher. Leashing, unleashing. You know this kind of curiosity thing. And I think that's got to be part of what you're talking about in this class. I also think it's just going to be a lot more fun to teach this way. I mean, yeah. it's the way I would have wanted to learn um, when I was in school. Well, what's the, what's the conventional way? Is lecture? Well, the conventional way is, is generally lecture. You sit and listen to a, you know, your professor talk to you and show you pictures and words for 45 minutes or 50 minutes. And then you go home and you do a problem set and you try to answer questions based on what you heard. But by being engaged in a much more hands-on manner, you're internalizing things in a way that you can't do if you're just passively sitting and listening. So in a conventional class, my, my roots are in law school, you do have Q&A. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can ask their professor a question and it better be a good one. And he can ask you a question and you, you'd better respond. <laughs> Um, is that in the conventional teaching of uh, physics, uh, geophysics and planetology? I mean, do you allow, in the conventional way, do you allow for Q&A both ways? Yes, normally, normally yeah. question. But, but I think that, that, um, that students grasp on the concepts and their ability to, to ask, the, ask the important questions is hampered by just sitting and listening. And I think if they, when they get the opportunity to, to try things out themselves, that's when they're really starting to, to get, a, get a full enough understanding that the questions they're asking are really relevant and, and, and show that they're developing their... This is the modern way. I mean, I've seen this. Uh, we made a movie at Mid-Pack High School where they do modular teaching like this and they form groups and then the teacher usually learns more than teaches? Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't know if it's that modern. I think it goes back to you know, the Socratic method in Socrates. Yeah, is you have back, groups yeah. of people and they're you know, actively doing something and then they have you know, a, a mentor that oversees what they're doing and guides them when they get stuck. Because you know, no one likes to get stuck and get frustrated. Um, we want them to you know, get stuck and make mistakes. That's when you learn the most. You know, we all learn from our mistakes. If you always get it right, you know, you don't quite learn as much. Oh, you know, you don't know how you got there sometimes. It's like, I got the right answer, but I don't really know yeah, how. You can't do it again. You can't apply it to other things right. if, you don't, if you don't have that. So how do you achieve this? I mean, first in a general sense, and then we'll take a break and come back and we'll go in detail. But conceptually, how do we achieve this interactive teaching experience in physics and planetology? How do you do that? So the way we want to achieve it is make it what they call a student-centered classroom. So it's not the professor up front, it's the students, and we break them into groups, and we let them explore the world, because you know, that's really the emphasis. So at first, we guide them through some questions, um, and we'll go on this in, in the next quarter. We'll talk about um, things like, okay, why do you think we have seasons? And they'll think about it, and then you know, we'll start with some demos and some models and let them explore to see if the models confirm or falsify their preconceived notions. Oh, exciting. Yeah. Either way, it's exciting. It is. It definitely is. a hard is. answer mm -hmm. to a question you didn't know the answer, but you had an idea, you but had, you weren't yeah. sure. Because you based your answers off of everyday experience, and sometimes everyday experience is misleading. Is misleading. <laughs> oh, yeah. As we'll find out. As we'll find out right after the break. That's Jeff Gillis-Davis and Hope Ishii. Uh, we'll be right back, and we're going to find out a lot more about it, how interactive geophysics and planetology works. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi, and you can catch me on Mondays at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii. Stacy to the rescue. See you then. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for Likeable Science 
with me, your host, Ethan Allen. One, nine, eight. We're back. We're live. Jeff Gillis Davis and Hopi Shee from uh, HIGP at SOWEST. We're talking about interactive new techniques about teaching undergraduates geophysics and planetology. So when I went to school, we always had show and tell. Okay, how about a little show and tell? What are these <laughs> things? What are these things on the table? Well, these are half spheres that are that re represent different planetary bodies, and um, the idea here is to let the students in the group actually physically play with these things, and to. Um, take the information that they have from their own observations. For example, the sun appears to rise um, in the east and set in the west. Um, so at this point, we know that the, that the sun is actually, the earth is actually circling That's the, the earth. sun. That's the earth. Yes, this is our, so yellow okay. is our sun, this is our earth, and then we have a little moon. little moon. And so using that information, they can figure out, for example, if this is the north pole of the earth, they can figure out which direction the earth should rotate. Yeah. And which, and then um, similarly, by knowing which um, which direction the moon rises and sets in the night sky, they can figure out which way the moon goes around the Earth. And so this is the, this is the kind of exercise where they can work with something that's three dimensional and take their pre-existing knowledge and apply it to figure out something on a much bigger scale and in a, in a manner that they wouldn't normally think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and after they're done, they can eat it because this is all mochi. <laughs> some kind of sugar on the top. <laughs> My kids try it. It doesn't taste no, very good. They don't like it, okay. <laughs> Star fun's not so great. Okay, so do you actually use things like this in the class? Yeah, absolutely. Physical, I mean, I think physical props, if you will, are, yeah. are great for, for figuring things out. In fact, a lot of times, um, uh, when when there's a, a problem that is is a three dimensional problem, for example, we'll sometimes you know we ourselves make three D props to, to look at things from from the right angle. Yeah, and then you can touch it. Absolutely, you can you touch it, you can turn it, you can. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you are you're using all of your senses. So what are the poo poos yeah. over in the left? Oh, these little poo poos with the toothpicks in them. So yeah. these are um, these are little props to help illustrate. Um, the way that the sun lights up the Earth and the tilt of the Earth's axis. Um, ah. So the Earth is actually spinning around its tilt axis. Okay. And depending on where it is in its orbit around the sun, um, the, the, the face that is illuminated is, is different relative to the tilt axis. And so this we can use to describe how in the um, northern hemisphere, um, when the tilt axis is pointing towards the sun, this um, side of the Earth is getting uh, more solar radiation than the, the southern hemisphere. And, and this would be, so this would be the, um, the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere, and the winter solstice, and then the equinoxes on the other side. So again, a, a physical three-dimensional model they, that the groups can play with and then try and figure some things out based on information that they have. Okay, and, and um, uh, when when they how big is the group and do they each get a set of planets and suns and moons and uh, yes well um, we're we're gonna see how it goes but we think we'll probably have groups of about four or five students and they'll each have a set that they that they play with and that they try to try to uh, figure out when they things come like to length the class, of the day and when they come to the group the team meeting I guess um, do they, have they read up before. Do they have a homework assignment? They do have some home. They do have some homework. Um, uh, the way we're uh, structuring this, the homework is more to introduce them to the concepts and get them sort of thinking about things before class, as opposed to an, a graded exercise. Mm -hmm. And then most of the the, the actual um, uh, exercises that they do will be in class, where they're solidifying the knowledge and, and really internalizing it. Um, okay. What, we, we have more show and tell. We have some photos. Can we go we, through yeah. the photos and you can explain? Sure. Um, so typically, so this is the uh, advert that we're using for the class, you know, going out and, you know, seeing what's really out there. Because, again, that's what science is doing is understanding what's out there. And next slide. So um, Hope made these. So I'll let you talk actually okay. through them. Yeah, you, <laughs> So this is another uh, way to, to have students using real data. This is actually uh, data off of a, a NASA data server. And um, the, this exercise that the students do is to, uh, to basically demonstrate that the seasons are caused by the tilt of the Earth, which gives you higher solar radiation flux um, when, the, when the Earth 
part of the Earth you're on is tilted towards the sun and, and less radiation flux when you're tilted mm. away from the sun. Mm. And um, so they can go, they can actually go in and do their own data mining, go and get their own, with, with their NASA, own data NASA sets. NASA gives away the NASA data. data so. on a, on it's a so server. nice. That's because you, you already own it. You're <laughs> a taxpayer. Right. This is your taxpayer Your taxpayer dollar dollars go to, you know, NASA, so you are part owner. What a wonderful concept. No kidding. That's yeah. great. It, actually, yeah. it's terrific. There's a lot of things you can do on this, on this, uh, this data server. But the, so the students go in and they can actually um, import the data and, and plot temperature um, versus date, and, and they can plot the solar radiation versus date, and they can see how well those two correlate with each other. And um, if we could bring up that slide one more time, the, um, the first image is actually, the blue line is the temperature between 2000 and 2001. These were just dates we picked at random. So that's the temperature in Honolulu, and then in red is the solar radiation flux. And you can see that those don't have a, a very good correlation with each other. Um, and part of that is because Honolulu is um, surrounded by ocean, which tends to mediate thermal effects oh, a lot. Oh, how interesting. But in Iowa, in they Central don't have Iowa, any ocean. <laughs> there's no yeah. Iowa. You're landlocked ocean right in corn. the middle of the state. <laughs> and you can see that the temperature and the solar radiation flux correlate pretty well. And if we go to the next slide, um, the top image is from Central Australia. So now we've gone from the Northern Hemisphere down to the Southern Hemisphere, and you can see that again, temperature and solar radiation flux correlate really well. Yeah, um, that's even better than Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, the, the peaks and valleys have, have switched because now we're in the Southern Hemisphere. And ah, so okay. uh, December in, in the Northern Hemisphere is, uh, is cold, but it's warm in the Southern Hemisphere. What about, what about the temperature versus date? What does that mean? Oh, that was, again, just showing the, 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 uh, the mirror image between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Oh, okay. And then we have little Honolulu close to the equator, which kind of... Just as, yeah. <laughs> so what we're trying to show with this is, you know, if you ask 10 students, and probably 10 professors, um, <laughs> 9 out of 10 students would say we have seasons because the distance between the Earth and Sun changes over the year, and we're closer in the summer than we are in the winter. And I, I would say that. And, that and you would me, yeah. Okay. And, and, and you'd be you know, wrong. And, and, you'd, and you'd be <laughs> wrong, but, you know, why that is, is, you know, it's kind of our Neanderthal self. You get close to a fire, you're warm. You get away from the fire, you get cold. So that's the everyday experience that makes sense. But what's happening is that you can see in those graphs is when our pole is tilted towards the sun in the northern hemisphere, we get uh, longer days. You know, it's about only two and a half hours different here in Hawaii between our summer solstice and our winter solstice. In Iowa, it's about four, four and a half hours difference. And of course, at the North Pole, it's 24 hour difference. Mm -hmm. In you know, summer solstice, you're light all day. And in the winter solstice, you're dark all night. So that amount of solar radiation allows heating. And, you know, the greater the solar illumination, the, the warmer you get. So that's what's causing our seasons. And then when we're pointed away, the sunlight is less direct. We get low solar irradiation. And we get weather, winter in the northern hemisphere. And southern hemisphere has their summer. So, you know, it's that idea of, okay, you ask a student what causes seasons. And they say, you know, distance from the earth. Because they know it's in a little ellipse. Um, and what we can do is say, okay, then if we look at this data, why is it that the southern hemisphere has summer when we have winter? Wouldn't both hemispheres have winter and summer at the same time if it was governed by distance between the Earth and the sun? So that's a hypothesis, and you can test it. It's like, okay, no, both hemispheres don't have the same season. They have opposite seasons, so there must be another cause. Um, and then we can look at the, the tilt and see how that correlates when the pole is tilted towards the sun, that's your summer, and when it's away from the sun, that's that hemisphere's winter. So, and, so we, go ahead. and we can then link, okay, the students did know that we're in an ellipse, but one thing we can do, again, with um, spacecraft data, is look at the sun. When something is close to you, you know, in your everyday experience, it's bigger than it is when it's farther away. And with NASA spacecraft, we can actually see the sun is closer to us in the winter, in the northern hemisphere winter. And then it, it, and about July 3rd, the sun's a little bit smaller. So we're actually farther away from the sun. It doesn't the, make any sense at all. Well, it's, it's <laughs> all because of that tilt. And we have an, the next graphic. I think it's graphic four. Oops, nope, next graphic. Okay, so here we have, 
you know, one of these is a circle, perfect circle, and one of these is an ellipse that represents Earth's orbit around the sun. And to first order, you would swear they were both circles. And that's a good critical thinking and skepticism. So what I, we can do is overlay the two. That's Wait, the next before you do that. Okay, yeah, so make I'm your guess. I'm going to tell you that the one on the left, the blue one, is a perfect circle. Wow. And the one on the right, the, the yellow one, is, an, is a, uh, what do you call it? Is, is the ellipse. Okay, so let's, right? let's, let's see. So let's see. Uh, you're right. You're so right. the orange one is the ellipse. But <laughs> Good eye. You can see from that graphic that uh, the Earth's orbit around the sun, while an ellipse, is pretty, pretty darn circular. Pretty close to a circle. Yeah, pretty <laughs> close to a circle. Really close. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with that, you know, we can see now yeah. that it's a pretty close to a circle and that, you know, we do, we are able to see the sun get a little bit bigger and a little bit smaller depending on what month it is, and in July, we're in the northern hemisphere, a little bit farther away from the sun. And in January, we're a little bit closer to the so sun. So this, this would advance their knowledge by large amounts because they, they come to you without really uh, this kind of sophistication. Uh, they come to you, they probably haven't studied the subject at all, except maybe grade school kind of right. exposure to it. Uh, and now you're, you're telling them, A, we're going to give you one, one uh, research point you have to look at, and we give you tools to look, and you have a team to bat it back and forth, and then you're on your own. How many research projects can they go through in a given semester? That's not that long. Is it just the one you start them with and the one they continue with, or is it more? Well, we're, we are intending to do four in a semester. Um, there are some other it's courses. It's roughly one a month, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, and there, there are some other classes that, that actually do more in a semester, but we're going we're gonna to start with four and see see how far they get. Oh, this would be great. This would be great. I think it would be very popular. You hear that? You've got to sign up for this one. <laughs> <laughs> but what, how do you grade somebody who is in a team like this, who is dealing with, you know, problems? Some of them may be harder than others. Some teams may have a different experience entirely. How do you, how do you grade them? Is it just how, you know, subjectively, how you perceive they're doing in the group or what? Well, we're going to use the framework of the scientific method, and so that'll, that'll form the basis for, for grading group projects, um, how, how um, well the, the group has understood the forming a hypothesis and dis deciding how to test it and carrying out the, the full scientific process. And so um, even though groups may choose different research avenues, um, ultimately the framework will be, will be the same. Yeah, how well did you set up your hypothesis and how well you tested it? And maybe we can go to that graph plot. We only have a few seconds left, but oh, go ahead, let's do it. So one of the things they might see in this graph is that there is a correlation. Like a slide four. See the slide <laughs> four. three or four? Okay, yeah, yes. that one. Yes. So, you know, here you see um, data for autism, a number of incidences, and organic food sales uh, from years about 90, 1998 to 2008. And you can see that the two are correlated, you know, as one goes up, the other goes up. So what we want to see is a student take this and be like, could this be, you know, is there some connection between organic food and autism? And, you know, there wouldn't be, a, uh, and so what they would do is set up a hypothesis, okay, how will I test this? You know, what is it about organic food that could cause autism? Are there, you know, any data out there that I can get like that NASA data? that would allow them so to test that. And let them let them add it. Mm -hmm. Let them add they it. Come up with, right? the best it reminds way to learn me how to so much of the it. science fair. Mm -hmm. Because in the science fair their kids are you know, they're prepared to answer the question, what is your hypothesis? What is your method of testing? What you know, what is the logic? What is your conclusion? Well, very interesting stuff. And maybe your kids and in, in students in this program could go to the science fair, walk around, and ask those questions to all these high school students and we really get something interesting out of it. Anyway, you guys, Jeffrey Gillis Davis and, uh, wait, sorry. It's okay. Hope you see. Thank you very much for coming down. It's been a very interesting discussion. I wish you well in the program. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Take care.